Welcome to this virtual press conference hosted by the American College of Surgeons during our 2020 Clinical Congress, which is also a virtual only event. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that all attendees have their mics muted during this session. The chat feature remains open for you to send questions to our media team should there be a Q&A portion with investigators after they've concluded their remarks. ACS has presented two clinical Congress panel sessions related to this issue. The first held yesterday afternoon addresses impact of marijuana use on the surgical patients, and a second session that just concluded covering when and how to quit cigarettes, vaping, and marijuana use prior to surgery. With us today are Dr. Jonas Dahlberg, the moderator of today's session of Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago, Dr. Malcolm Camp from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health in Madison, Dr. Thomas Varghese from the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, and Dr. John Daly from the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University in Philadelphia, who moderated yesterday's session on marijuana use in the surgical patient. And now, here's the moderator for today's press briefing, Dr. Jonas Stolberg. Hello, and thank you for that introduction. My name is Dr. Jonas Stolberg. I'm a general surgeon and health services researcher at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. As a general surgeon, I always counsel my patients that I'm trying to get to work with them to get the best outcome we can together as a team. And that means that I'm doing everything I can to optimize them for surgery and optimize my practice around their care. And I work with them so that they can optimize everything that they can to get ready for surgery and be prepared for the best possible outcome. I share with my patients the interest in having the best possible outcome in every single surgery that we do. In this particular session and in this press conference, we're talking about how smoking in particular overlaps with that question of how do we get patients the best outcome. Smoking has remained a public health problem for decades now. And even though we made a lot of progress in decreasing smoking, smoking rates in our population over the last several decades, we've seen a rise in marijuana use with its legalization, as well as vaping. And any of these inhaled smoking agents can have adverse effects. And so today we talked in our panel session, helped educate other surgeons and give out patient education material so that we can do a better job of getting patients to quit smoking prior to surgery. And today we have three uh, experts in the field who are going to help us navigate how do we do this best for our patients and how do we achieve that best outcome. And we're also going to tell you about the resources that are available through the American College of Surgeons to help support surgeons and help support patients in that goal of best outcomes for all of our patients. And so with that, I'd like to turn over to the next slide and have Dr. DeCamp. Thank you, Dr. Stolberg. Uh, I'm Malcolm DeCamp. I'm a general thoracic surgeon and a professor of surgery here at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and I'm happy to, to be here to talk to you today and to talk earlier to colleagues about the importance of and the techniques for helping our patients quit smoking before surgery. Uh, meeting a surgeon with a, in my world, a cancer diagnosis, because I, I spend most of my time taking care of patients with lung or esophageal cancer, is the ultimate, teach, ultimate teacher, teachable moment. Um, patients uh, at a crisis uh, in their life with uh, facing a life-threatening injury, lung cancer kills more people, men, women, uh, than any of the next three or four cancers added together. So it immediately gets their attention. Um, and it's a, it's a very pivotal time. Um, I try to, to not blame them for their, their habitual problems, but I try to uh, get them to work together with us uh, to decrease the risks associated with what surgical intervention we need to, in our effort to cure them of this cancer. So uh, I first of all reassure them that we're taking these risks together and that we each need, need to do our, our best to do, diminish the risks, much as Dr. Stolberg uh, mentioned before. So we try to turn this teachable moment into a positive and reinforce the opportunities they have to, to get help. Um, there's usually three pivotal uh, interventions to help people quit smoking. There's a combination of counseling, 
the appropriate use of nicotine replacement therapies, both short and long acting, like a patch and lozenges. And there's, there's pharmacologic aids that are effective. And we, we spent some time with the uh, uh, physicians earlier today talking about using combinations of these and how there's excellent evidence that the, there is synergism between using combinations of counseling, nicotine replacement, and pharmacologic aids uh, to help people and quit smoking. And that in multiple publications, folks that quit or around the time of surgery have a higher abstinence rate later, so that there is really evidence to support this concept of a teachable moment. American College of Surgeons uh, has acknowledged how important this is. They have a position statement that uh, we have available here uh, with the link at the bottom of the slide that uh, points out that tobacco use uh, has a significant impact on increased risk of complications of surgery and, and promotes the utility of efforts to quit smoking prior to surgery to benefit both patients and their surgeon. We provide a number of patient education tools that you'll hear about in a little bit, um, as well as professional courses to help surgeons become better advocates for their patients to help them quit smoking. At the end of the day, we want our patients to be headed downhill with a tailwind through their surgical enterprise. We don't want them struggling uphill. We want to make their recovery smooth and easy uh, and their period of time in the hospital as brief as possible so that spending a, a, a time like we have today emphasizing this is critically important to improving the outcomes and decreasing the costs of care in our country. Thanks for your attention. And with that, I'll hand over to my colleague, Dr. Tom Varghese. Thanks, uh, Dr. Stolberg, and thanks, Dr. DeCamp. Uh, my name is Tom Varghese. I'm a thoracic surgeon and professor of surgery here at the University of Utah. And I also hold the distinct pleasure of uh, and honor of being the medical director for the ACS Strong for Surgery program. And so one question that people often ask is, why do complications and adverse events around the time of surgical interventions still occur despite decades worth of evidence? Well, one reason is that clinical practices and sites do not have an organized framework to implement evidence-based interventions for every patient in a standardized and organized fashion. That's the reason why Strong for Surgery was conceived. It was initially conceived at the University of Washington in 2012, spread throughout the Pacific Northwest, and officially became a quality program of the American College of Surgeons in 2016. At the end of 2019, the program is active at over 331 sites across the nation. Strong for Surgery is based on two principles, raising awareness and changing practice. And, and the raising awareness is in the backdrop of a public awareness campaign the changing practice includes optimization bundles, including checklists. On the screen is displayed the smoking cessation checklist. And so we know the evidence works that if we get patients to stop smoking prior to their surgical intervention, they have improved outcomes and better results. And so this checklist is organized in two fashions. There's two steps. One is quantifying the amount of the cigarettes that the patients are using including potentially use of other inhalation agents. And then the second thing is bringing an organized fashion to qu determine a quit date and then select the program to help them quit. As Dr. DeCamp uh, alluded to, we're not doing this in any type of judgmental fashion. Patients are motivated to get the best results at the time of the surgical intervention. We're trying to help patients each and every single time. Further details about other optimization areas for strong for surgery, including optimizing nutrition, blood sugar control, optimizing medications, pain control, as well as shared decision-making can be found at the ACS Strong for Surgery website. And with that, I'll turn things over to Dr. Daly. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I point out here on this first slide uh, that the College of Surgeons has an enormous amount of resources for patient education, and they can be accessed through the website at the American College of Surgeons. And I would encourage you to use those for your patients. This is some examples of this with surgical prep brochures, but we also have home skills management kits, which are for ostomies, central lines, for wound management at home, a cancer series on lung cancer, and of course, working with Strong for Surgery. There are a variety of ways that you can help your patients before their operation, and then follow that transition to their home care. I'm Dr. John Daly. I am a professor of surgery 
and the interim dean at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine, and I co-chair the Patient Education Committee with Dr. Ajit Sachdeva. For today, I wanted to talk briefly about marijuana and its increasing use. As you know, 30 plus states in the United States now are permissive for marijuana use. But these, the use of this medication, if you will, a drug, has multiple side effects, including memory, motor, paranoia, and cardiac side effects, frequently with hypertension and also an increase in platelet aggravation. Uh, uh, there is also a mild dependency and there are cognition effects which occur as well. If patients present to you, uh, the question should be, are they new or chronic users? Are they recreational or medical users? What's the frequency of the use and the route which they utilize marijuana? and the time lapse since their last use. We know that low doses increases the sympathetic system with an increase in heart rate and associated hypertension, but there are cardiac risks and airway risks such as bronchospasm as well. So if possible, for an individual who is a chronic user, try to delay their elective operation for at least 72 hours. However, we know that trauma patients have an increased rate of usage by history. And so the emergency operation in a patient who has been known to use requires special cardiopulmonary anesthesia and care, recognition of the potential for deep venous thrombosis, as well as pain management. With pain management, we've seen that patients who are chronic marijuana users demonstrate an increased requirement for opioids postoperatively. We know that they have an increase, for example, in those undergoing knee arthroplasty, there's an increase in the readmission rate and postoperative cost. The trauma patients have an increase in use and require more opioids after their uh, surgery for trauma and their recovery through the traumatic event. And randomized clinical trials in multiple situations have shown an increase in opioid use. I would tell you that this presentation was delivered on Monday at four o'clock as part of the American College of Surgeons Clinical Congress by Dr. Shulman O'Donnell, Rasco, and McGuire. I would recommend the, you view the entire series uh, for maximum benefit. Thank you very much for your attention. So one of the important points that I felt came out of our session today, which wasn't necessarily uh, covered so far that I'd like to highlight, is that patients come in um, smoking cigarettes, uh, vaping, or smoking marijuana. And many of us are faced with the dilemma of when to operate, um, what operation to offer, and how to support that patient in trying to get them off of their um, cigarettes, marijuana, or vaping. And one of the points that came through our conversation is that a lot of the negative effects that we see from the literature are related to the inhalation of a smoke and agent. So if we can move patients off of their cigarettes onto nicotine replacement to then offer, for instance, a thoracic procedure, a colorectal cancer procedure, something that we aren't going to delay four to six months to give them adequate time to fully quit and come off of nicotine, that is often far preferable and better for the patient than simply proceeding and having them continue to smoke. Uh, and the same sounds like it was true for the marijuana session. If you can move patients off of smoking marijuana to uh, ingestibles of some form, um, you can remove at least the cardiopulmonary effects and then perhaps treat and deal with uh, the medication effects of either the nicotine or the marijuana that they're getting through another form. So that I think is an important point because when we look at data through the American College of Surgeons NISQIP database, we see that for many of our cases, the smoking rate of active smoker mimics that or is slightly below that of the general population. And I think this is an important point for us to get out to our surgeon colleagues and to get out to our patients that simply moving to a different agent could be an excellent bridge and reverse some of the detrimental side effects, even if we can't completely get off 
patients off for longer periods of time. Thank you for that excellent summary, Dr. Stolberg. Um, I have a quick question. So what's the recommended time off of um, these agents to see a benefit in, sur in a surgical patient before they would undergo an operation? So there has been a meta-analysis that showed that we see benefits to outcomes after two to three weeks off of cigarette smoking. Ideally, we aim for, uh, I believe it was four months in the thoracic literature. Is that correct, Dr. DeCamp? Weeks. And, I'm sorry, four weeks, sorry, four weeks, four weeks in the thoracic literature. And I know that in elective repairs, such as hernia repair, we aim for three months. So we aim for two to three months. So in an, uh, you know, minimally symptomatic inguinal hernia, uh, in a, a ventral hernia that uh, doesn't have high risk features, many people will advocate for two to three months. And we often work on many of the other things within the Strong for Surgery Toolkit, for instance, within that time, optimizing blood pressure, blood sugar, getting patients walking and doing other activities. They're very beneficial for these elective cases. So there's a, there's a spectrum, but two to three weeks uh, is the recommended minimum amount off for uh, based on that analysis. I think it's also important, Jonah, to rec to send a message to the public that while any bit of smoking cessation is good, we don't want them to delay their access to uh, their providers. Um, it we you will you need to meet your surgeon. You need to have a conversation with the surgeon about smoking cessation. But uh, despite your best efforts, we don't want you doing this at home and then coming to the surgeon and delaying uh, the important. In things that we need to do prior to an operation. Um, so we don't want people, especially in this era of COVID where people are concerned, uh, we don't want them deferring uh, their their interaction with the experts while they're trying to quit. And, and, I, and I think the only thing I would add is, is that, as has been alluded to, this is a partnership. You know, it's a partnership between surgeons and their patients. Uh, we never want to come out as being judgmental or making patients feel that they're alone in their quest to optimize their health. And so by doing this in an organized fashion and doing it each and every single time for every one of our patients, that's what leads to the best results and uh, consistent uh, best performance for the system as a whole.